This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Statistics show 64,000 overcrowded dwellings, from three to five persons per room in the city of Paris alone. To be sure, the killer of children is a particularly vile creature who scarcely arouses pity. It is probable too, I say probable, that none of my readers forced to live in the same condition would go so far as to kill children. Hence, there is no question of reducing the culpability of certain monsters. But those monsters in decent dwellings would perhaps have had no occasion to go so far. The least that can be said is that they are not alone guilty, and it seems strange that the right to punish them should be granted to the very people who subsidize not housing, but the growing of beets for the production of alcohol. But alcohol makes this scandal even more shocking. It is known that the French nation is systematically intoxicated by its parliamentary majority for generally vile reasons. Now, the proportion of alcohol's responsibility in the cause of bloodthirsty crimes is shocking. A lawyer, Maltre Guillon, estimated it at 60%. For Dr. Lagriffe, the proportion extends from 41.7 to 72%. An investigation carried out in 1951 in the clearing center of the Fren prison among the common law criminals showed 29% to be chronic alcoholics and 24% to have an alcoholic inheritance. Finally, 95% of the killers of children are alcoholics. These are impressive figures. We can balance them with an even more magnificent figure. The tax report of a firm producing apparatifs, which in 1953 showed a profit of 410 million francs. Comparison of these figures justifies informing the stockholders of that firm and the deputies with a financial interest in alcohol that they have certainly killed more children than they think. As an opponent of capital punishment, I am far from asking that they be condemned to death, but to begin with, it strikes me as indispensable and urgent to take them under military escort to the next execution of a murderer of children, and to hand them on their way out a statistical report including the figures I have given. The state that sows alcohol cannot be surprised to reap crime. Instead of showing surprise, it simply goes on cutting off heads into which it has poured so much alcohol. It meets out justice imperturbably and poses as a creditor. Its good conscience does not suffer at all. Witness the alcohol salesman who, in answer to the Figaro's question, exclaimed, I know just what the staunchest enemy of the death penalty would do if having a weapon within reach he suddenly saw assassins on the point of killing his father, his mother, his children, or his best friend. Well, that well in itself seems somewhat alcoholized. Naturally, the staunchest enemy of capital punishment would shoot those murderers, and rightfully so, without thereby losing any of his reasons for staunchly defending abolition of the death penalty. But if he were to follow through his thinking, and the aforementioned assassins reeked of alcohol, he would then go and take care of those whose vocation is to intoxicate future criminals. It is even quite surprising that the relatives of victims of alcoholic crimes have never thought of getting some enlightenment from the parliament, Yet nothing of sort takes place, and the state, enjoying general confidence, even supported by public opinion, goes on chastising assassins, particularly the alcoholics, somewhat in the way the pimp chastises the hard-working creatures who assure his livelihood. But the pimp at least does no moralizing. The state does. Although jurisprudence admits that drunkenness sometimes constitutes an extenuating circumstance, the state is ignorant of chronic alcoholism. Drunkenness, however, accompanies only crimes of violence, which are not punished with death, whereas the chronic alcoholic is capable also of premeditated crimes, which will bring about his death. Consequently, the states reserve the right to punish in the only case in which it has a real responsibility. Does this amount to saying that every alcoholic must be declared irresponsible by a state that will beat its breast until the nation drinks nothing but fruit juice? Certainly not. No more than that the reason based on heredity should cancel all culpability. The real responsibility of an offender cannot be precisely measured. We know that arithmetic is incapable of adding up the number of our antecedents, whether alcoholic or not. Going back to the beginning of time, the figure would be 22 times, raised to the 10th power, 
greater than the number of present inhabitants of the earth. The number of bad or morbid predispositions our antecedents have been able to transmit to us is, thus, incalculable. We come into the world laden with weight of an infinite necessity. One would have to grant us, therefore, a general irresponsibility. Logic would demand that neither punishment nor reward should ever be meted out, and by the same token, all society would become impossible. The instinct of preservation of societies, and hence of individuals, requires instead that individual responsibility be postulated and accepted without dreaming of an absolute indulgence that would amount to the death of all society. But the same reasoning must lead us to conclude that there never exists any total responsibility or, consequently, any absolute punishment or reward. No one can be rewarded completely, not even the winners of Nobel Prizes. But no one should be punished absolutely if he is thought guilty, and certainly not if there is a chance of his being innocent. The death penalty, which really neither provides an example nor assures distributive justice, simply usurps an exorbitant privilege by claiming to punish an always relative culpability by a definitive and irreparable punishment. If indeed capital punishment represents a doubtful example and an unsatisfactory justice, we must agree with its defenders that it is eliminative. The death penalty definitely eliminates the condemned man. That alone, to tell the truth, ought to exclude, for its partisans especially, the repetition of risky arguments which, as we have just seen, can always be contested. Instead, one might frankly say that it is definitive because it must be, and affirm that certain men are irremediable in society, that they constitute a permanent danger for every citizen and for the social order, and that therefore, before anything else, they must be suppressed. No one, in any case, can refute the existence in society of certain wild animals whose energy and brutality nothing seems capable of breaking. The death penalty, to be sure, does not solve the problem they create. Let us agree, at least, that it suppresses the problem. I shall come back to such men. But is capital punishment applied only to them? Is there any assurance that none of those executed is remediable? Can it even be asserted that none of them is innocent? In both cases, must it not be admitted that capital punishment is eliminative only in so far as it is irreparable? The 15th of March, 1957, Burton Abbott was executed in California, condemned to death for having murdered a little girl of 14. Men who commit such heinous crimes are, I believe, classified among the irremediable. Although Abbott continually protested his innocence, he was condemned. His execution had been set for the 15th of March at 10 o'clock. At 9.10, a delay was granted to allow his attorney to make a final appeal. At 11 o'clock, the appeal was refused. At 11.15, Abbott entered the gas chamber. At 11.18, he breathed in his first whiffs of gas. At 11.20, the secretary of the Committee of Reprieves called on the telephone. The committee had changed its mind. They had tried to reach the governor, who was out sailing. Then they had phoned the prison directly. Abbott was taken from the gas chamber. It was too late. If only it had been cloudy over California that day, the governor would not have gone out sailing. He would have telephoned two minutes earlier, Today, Abbott would be alive and would perhaps see his innocence proved. Any other penalty, even the harshest, would have left him that chance. The death penalty left him none. This case is exceptional, some will say. Our lives are exceptional too, and yet, in the fleeting existence that is ours, this takes place near us, at some ten hours' distance by air. Abbott's misfortune is less an exception than a news item like so many others, a mistake that is not isolated if we can believe our newspapers. See Deshaies' case to cite but the most recent one. The jurist, Olive Qua, applying the law of probability to the chance of judicial error around 1860, concluded that perhaps one innocent man was condemned in every 257 cases. The proportion is small, it is small in relation to average penalties. It is infinite in relation to capital punishment. 
When Hugo writes that to him the name of the guillotine is Le Cirque, he does not mean that all those who are decapitated are Le Cirques, but that one Le Cirque is enough for the guillotine to be permanently dishonored. It is understandable that Belgium gave up once and for all pronouncing the death penalty after a judicial error and that England raised the question of abolition after the Hayes case. It is also possible to understand the conclusions of the Attorney General who, when consulted as to the appeal of a very probably guilty criminal whose victim had not been found, wrote, The survival of X gives the authorities the possibility of examining at leisure any new clue that might eventually be brought in as to the existence of his wife. On the other hand, the execution by cancelling that hypothetical possibility of examination would, I fear, give to the slightest clue a theoretical value, a power of regret that I think it inopportune to create. A love of justice and truth is expressed here in a most moving way, and it would be appropriate to quote often in our courts that power of regret, which so vividly sums up the danger that faces every juror. Once the innocent man is dead, no one can do anything for him, in fact, but to rehabilitate him. If there is still someone to ask for this, then he is given back his innocence, which, to tell the truth, he had never lost, but the persecution of which he was a victim, his dreadful sufferings, his horrible death have been given him forever. It remains only to think of the innocent men of the future, so that these tortures may be spared them. This was done in Belgium. In France, consciences are apparently untroubled. Probably, the French take comfort from the idea that justice has progressed hand in hand with science. When the learned expert holds forth in court, it seems as if a priest has spoken, and the jury, raised in the religion of science, express its opinion. However, recent cases, chief among them the Besnard case, have shown us what a comedy of experts is like. Culpability is no better established for having been established in a test tube, even a graduated one. A second test tube will tell a different story, and the personal equation loses none of its importance in such dangerous mathematics. The proportion of learned men who are really experts is the same as that of judges who are psychologists, hardly any greater than that of serious and objective juries. Today, as yesterday, the chance of error remains. Tomorrow another expert testimony will declare the innocence of some abbot or other, but abbot will be dead, scientifically dead, and the science that claims to prove innocence as well as guilt has not yet reached the point of resuscitating those it kills. Among the guilty themselves, is there any assurance that none but the irretrievable have been killed? And those who, like me, have at a period of their lives necessarily followed the assize courts know that a large element of chance enters into any sentence. The look of the accused, his antecedents, adultery is often looked upon as an aggravating circumstance by jurors who may or may not all have been always faithful, his manner, which is in his favor only if it is conventional, in other words, play-acting most of the time, his very elocution, the old hand knows that one must neither stammer nor be too eloquent, the mishaps of the trial enjoyed in a sentimental key, and the truth, alas, is not always emotionally effective. So many flukes that influence the final decision of the jury. At the moment of the death verdict, one may be sure that to arrive at the most definite of penalties, an extraordinary combination of uncertainties was necessary. When it is known that the supreme verdict depends on the jury's evaluation of extenuating circumstances, when it is known above all that the reform of 1832 gave our juries the power of granting indeterminate extenuating circumstances, it is possible to imagine the latitude left to the passing mood of the juror. The law no longer foresees precisely the cases in which death is to be the outcome, so the jury decides after the event by guesswork. Inasmuch as there are never two comparable juries, the man who is executed might well not have been. Beyond reclaim in the eyes of the respectable people of Ile et Vilaine, he would have been granted a semblance of excuse by the good citizens of the Var. Unfortunately, the same blade falls in the two departments, and it makes no distinction. The temporal risks are added to the geographical risks to increase the general absurdity. The French communist workman who had just been guillotined in Algeria for having put a bomb, discovered before it went off, in a factory locker room, 
was condemned just as much because of the general climate as because of what he did. In the present state of mind in Algeria, there was a desire at one and the same time to prove to the Arab opinion that the guillotine was designed for Frenchmen too, and to satisfy the French opinion wrought up by the crime of terrorism. At the same time, however, the minister who approved the execution was accepting communist votes in his electoral district. If the circumstances had been different, the accused would have gotten off easy, and his only risk, once he had become a deputy of the party, would be finding himself having a drink at the same bar as the minister some day. Such thoughts are bitter, and one would like them to remain alive in the minds of our leaders. They must know that times and customs change. A day comes when the guilty man, too rapidly executed, does not seem so black. But it is too late, and there is no alternative but to repent or to forget. Of course, people forget. Nonetheless, society is no less affected. The unpunished crime, according to the Greeks, infected the whole city. But innocence condemned, or crime too severely punished in the long run, soils the city just as much. We know this in France. Such, it will be said, is human justice, and despite its imperfections, it is better than arbitrariness. But that sad evaluation is bearable only in connection with ordinary penalties. It is scandalous in the face of verdicts of death. A classic treatise on French law, in order to excuse the death penalty for not involving degrees, states this, Human justice has not the slightest desire to assure such a proportion. Why? Because it knows it is frail. Must we therefore conclude that such frailty authorizes us to pronounce an absolute judgment and that uncertain of ever achieving pure justice, society must rush headlong through the greatest risks towards supreme injustice? If justice admits that it is frail, would it not be better for justice to be modest and to allow its judgment sufficient latitude so that a mistake can be corrected? Could not justice concede to the criminal the same weakness in which society hands a sort of permanent extenuating circumstance for itself? Can the jury decently say, if I kill you by mistake, you will forgive me when you consider the weakness of our common nature, but I am condemning you to death without considering those weaknesses or that nature. There is a solidarity of all men in error and aberration must that solidarity operate for the tribunal and be denied to the accused? No. And if justice has any meaning in this world, it means nothing but the recognition of that solidarity. It cannot, by its very essence, divorce itself from compassion. Compassion, of course, can in this instance be but awareness of a common suffering and not a frivolous indulgence, paying no attention to the suffering and rights of the victim. Compassion does not exclude punishment but it suspends the final condemnation. Compassion loathes the definitive, irreparable measure that does an injustice to mankind as a whole because of failing to take into account the wretchedness of the common condition. To tell the truth, certain juries are well aware of this, for they often admit extenuating circumstances in a crime that nothing can extenuate. This is because the death penalty seems excessive to them in such cases, and they prefer not punishing enough to punishing too much. The extreme severity of the penalty then favors crimes instead of penalizing it. There is not a court session during which we do not read in the press that a verdict is incoherent and that, in views of the facts, it seems either insufficient or excessive. But the jurors are not ignorant of this. However, faced with the enormity of capital punishment, they prefer, as we too should prefer, to look like fools rather than to compromise their nights to come. Knowing themselves to be fallible, they at least draw the appropriate consequences. And true justice is on their side, precisely insofar as logic is not. There are, however, major criminals who a jury would condemn at any time and in any place whatever. Their crimes are not open to doubt, and the evidence brought by the accusation is confirmed by the confessions of the defense. Most likely, everything that is abnormal and monstrous in them is enough to classify them as pathological. But the psychiatric experts, in the majority of cases, affirm their responsibility. Recently, in Paris, a young man, somewhat weak in character but kind and affectionate, devoted to his family, was, according to his own admission, annoyed by a remark his father made about his coming home too late. The father was sitting reading at the dining room table. The young man seized an axe 
and dealt his father several blows from behind. Then in the same way he struck down his mother, who was in the kitchen. He undressed, hid his blood-stained trousers in the closet, went to make a call on the family of his fiancée without showing any signs, then returned home and noticed the police that he had just found his parents murdered. The police immediately discovered the blood-stained trousers and, without difficulty, got a calm confession from the parricide. The psychiatrist decided that this man who murdered through annoyance was responsible. His odd indifference, of which he was to give other indications in prison, showing pleasure because his parents' funeral had attracted so many people, they were much loved, he told his lawyer, cannot, however, be considered as normal. But his reasoning power was apparently untouched. Many monsters offer equally impenetrable exteriors. They are eliminated on the mere consideration of the facts. Apparently the nature or the magnitude of their crimes allows no room for imagining that they could ever repent or reform. They must merely be kept from doing it again, and there is no other solution but to eliminate them. On this frontier, and on it alone, discussion about the death penalty is legitimate. In all other cases, the arguments for capital punishment do not stand up to the criticisms of the abolitionists, but in extreme cases, and in our state of ignorance, we make a wager. No fact, no reasoning can bring together those who think that a chance must always be left to the vilest of men and those who consider that chance illusory. But it is perhaps possible, on that final frontier, to go beyond the long opposition between partisans and adversaries of the death penalty by weighing the advisability of that penalty today and in Europe. With much less competence, I shall try to reply to the wish expressed by Swiss jurist Professor Jean Grevin, who wrote in 1952 in his remarkable study on the problem of the death penalty, faced with the problem that is once more confronting our conscience and our reason, we think that a solution must be sought, not through the conceptions, problems, and arguments of the past, nor through the hopes and theoretical promises of the future, but through the ideas, recognized facts, and necessities of the present. It is possible, indeed, to debate endlessly as to the benefits or harms attributable to the death penalty through the ages or in an intellectual vacuum. But it plays a role here and now, and we must take our stand here and now in relation to the modern executioner. What does the death penalty mean to men of the mid-century? To simplify matters, let us say that our civilization has lost the only values that it, in a certain way, can justify that penalty and, on the other hand, suffers from evils that necessitate its suppression. In other words, the abolition of the death penalty ought to be asked for by all thinking members of our society for reasons both of logic and of realism. Of logic, to begin with, deciding that a man must have the definitive punishment imposed on him is tantamount to deciding that that man has no chance of making amends. This is the point. To repeat ourselves, where the arguments clash blindly and crystallize in a sterile opposition. But it so happens that none among us can settle the question, for we are all both judges and interested parties. Whence our uncertainty as to our right to kill and our inability to convince each other. Without absolute innocence, there is no supreme judge. Now we have all done wrong in our lives, even if that wrong, without falling within the jurisdiction of the law, went as far as the unknown crime. There are no just people, merely hearts more or less lacking in justice. Living at least allows us to discover this, and to add to the sum of our actions a little of the good that will make up in part for the evil we have added to the world. Such a right to live, which allows a chance to make amends, is the natural right of every man, even the worst man. The lowest of criminals and the most upright of judges meet side by side, equally wretched in their solidarity. Without that right, moral life is utterly impossible. None among us is authorized to despair of a single man, except after his death, which transforms his life into destiny and then permits a definitive judgment. But pronouncing the definitive judgment before his death, decreeing the closing of accounts when the creditor is still alive, is no man's right. On this limit, at least, whoever judges absolutely condemns himself absolutely. Bernard Fallot of the Masui Gang, working for the Gestapo, was condemned to death after admitting the many terrible crimes of which he was guilty, and declared himself that he could not be pardoned. 
My hands are too red with blood, he told a prison mate. Publication and the opinion of his judges certainly classed among the irremediable, and I should have been tempted to agree if I had not read a surprising testimony. This is what Fellow said to the same companion after declaring that he wanted to die courageously. Shall I tell you my greatest regret? Well, it is not having known the Bible I now have here. I assure you that I wouldn't be where I now am. There is no question of giving in to some conventional set of sentimental pictures and calling to mind Victor Hugo's good convicts. The Age of Enlightenment, as people say, wanted to suppress the death penalty on the pretext that man was naturally good. Of course he is not. He is worse or better. After twenty years of our magnificent history we are well aware of this, but precisely because he is not absolutely good, no one among us can pose an absolute judge and pronounce the definitive elimination of the worst among the guilty. Capital judgment upsets the only indisputable human solidarity, our solidarity against death, and it can be legitimized only by a truth or a principle that is superior to man. In fact, the supreme punishment has always been, throughout the ages, a religious penalty, inflicted in the name of the king, God's representative on earth, or by priests, or in the name of society considered as a sacred body, it denies not human solidarity, but the guilty man's membership in the divine community, the only thing that can give him life. Life on earth is taken from him, to be sure, but his chance of making amends is left to him. The real judgment is not pronounced. It will be in the other world. Only religious values, and especially belief in eternal life, can therefore serve as a basis for the supreme punishment because according to their own logic, they keep it from being definitive and irreparable. Consequently, it is justified only in so far as it is not supreme. The Catholic Church, for example, has always accepted the necessity of the death penalty. It inflicted that penalty itself and without stint in other periods. Even today, it justifies it and grants the state the right to apply it. The Church's position, however subtle, contains a very deep feeling that was expressed directly in 1937 by a Swiss national councillor from Freiburg during a discussion in the National Council. According to M. Grand, the lowest of criminals when faced with execution withdraws into himself. He repents, and his preparation for death is thereby facilitated. The Church has saved one of its members and fulfilled its defined mission. This is why it has always accepted the death penalty not only as a means of self-defense, but as a powerful means of salvation. Without trying to make of it a thing of the church, the death penalty can point proudly to its almost divine efficacy, like war. By virtue of the same reasoning, probably there could be read on the sword of the Freiburg executioner the words, Lord Jesus, thou art the judge. Hence, the executioner is invested with a sacred function, he is the man who destroys the body in order to deliver the soul to the divine sentence, which no one can judge beforehand. Some may think that such words imply rather scandalous confusions, and, to be sure, whoever clings to the teachings of Jesus will look upon that handsome sword as one more outrage to the person of Christ. In the light of this, it is possible to understand the dreadful remark of the Russian condemned man about to be hanged by the Tsar's executioner in 1905, who said firmly to the priest who had come to console him with the image of Christ, Go away and commit no sacrilege. The unbeliever cannot keep from thinking that men who have set at the center of their faith the staggering victim of a judicial error ought at least to hesitate before committing legal murder. Believers might also be reminded that Emperor Julian, before his conversion, did not want to give official offices to Christians because they systematically refused to pronounce death sentences or to have anything to do with them. For five centuries, Christians therefore believed that the strict moral teaching of their master forbade killing. But Catholic faith is not nourished solely by the personal teachings of Christ. It also feeds on the Old Testament, on St. Paul, and on the Church Fathers. In particular, the immortality of the soul and the universal resurrection of bodies are articles of dogma. As a result, capital punishment is for the believer a temporary penalty that leaves the final sentence in suspense, an arrangement necessary only for terrestrial order, an administrative measure which, far from signifying the end for the guilty man, may instead favor his redemption. 
I am not saying that all believers agree with this, and I can readily imagine that some Catholics may stand closer to Christ than to Moses or St. Paul. I am simply saying that faith in the immortality of the soul allowed Catholicism to see the problem of capital punishment in very different terms and to justify it. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.